So this video on line integrals will probably be our most involved video so far. So there's a couple things I want to go over, so many things I've already written down. First, we're just going to go over complex functions and how to integrate them. So here I've written a complex function, f of t equals x of t plus i y of t. And a few things to note, um, it takes in the variable t, which is a real number, and I've split it up into real uh, function x of t and imaginary function y of t, just like we did in the previous video on uh, curves. So this is just a function, and t is going to go in the range from a to b. And again, these are real numbers. So to integrate this function, we're going to integrate from a to b. Uh, we're going to in integrate the function f of t dt um, equals integral of x of t from a to b um, plus i times the integral of y of t from a to b. So we see that to integrate something that you have split into real and imaginary parts, you just integrate the real and imaginary parts separately. And of course, this i will be here. So it's a little intuitive in that sense. So now we're going to get right into the topic of this video and talk about line integrals. So here's what we wish to uh, evaluate. If you remember line integrals from multivariable calculus, that's great. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a refresher right here. So first we're going to go over what is a line integral. So it, it, the name kind of suggests a lot of things, but um, I think it's more properly be named a curve integral, but we'll stick with line integral. So we draw any curve we want. So from the previous video, we know that there's many classifications of curves, but here's one. So A to B, and of course, we need a direction. So here's our direction of travel. Now, a line integral involves a curve and a function. So back here, the function here is V of Z, where Z is complex number. So V of Z. Now, as we move along this curve, we have different values of Z. So here, Z, maybe it's 3 minus 2i. Maybe at, at point B, it's negative uh, 4 plus 1i. And of course, different values of z all along. And this is on the complex plane. So what is the line integral? What is uh, this What is this entity? What is? How do we calculate it? So uh, just to make it simple, we start at a. And at this point, let's say it's 3, mi uh, 3 minus 2i. We plug that into our function v. We plug that into the, as z in our function. And we get uh, some v1. That's the first value of the function. We save that. We move to the next point, which is a little bit misleading because there is no real next point when you're dealing with infinitesimally small things. But let's just say we move to the next point, and of course this is calculus, so we're very, very close to the initial point. Um, and then we take that value, and you put that for z, and you get a new value, v, uh, v2. Then you go to the next point, you get a v3. And you keep doing that for every single point on this curve. So as you travel on this curve, every time you get to the next point, you plug it right in here, you get the next v, and then finally we arrive at the b point and we get the point V, N. And there's going to be, of course, an infinite amount of these. And what we do with these is we sum them up, we take their sum, and we get, let's say, uppercase V, and that is going to be our line integral. So just to recap, a line integral is when you have a curve, um, a line in quotation marks, and you take the value of the function at each point along your curve, and then you sum it all up, and then that's going to be the value of the line integral. So let's see what that implies. So. Uh, to get the formula for this, let's let's see what's going on. So z, which is what we're plugging in, is determined by what? It's determined by the curve. We can only plug in z's that are on the curve. So that means z equals gamma of t, because that's what's going to tell us what's on the curve. So now let's take dz dt, the derivative, equals gamma prime of t. And if we rearrange that, we get dz equals gamma prime of t dt. So now we have all the tools in place to transform this integral in the limits and with what it's with respect to. So right now it's with respect to dz. We would like it with respect to dt. So now we have v, and z we said was gamma of t. So we're going to put gamma of t. And then dz we said was gamma prime of t dt. So this is gamma prime of t dt. And now the it's respect to t. So we want to find the limits with respect to t. And the limits are, of course, a to b. And that's it. So this line integral is evaluated like this. And although this form seems messier, it's a lot more useful in evaluating it. Because now what you can do is you know a and b. And you can calculate the derivative if you know the gamma. And you can just plug the gamma in here and you can evaluate it. So that's how you, that, that's how you transform this into this. And we'll do some problems later on involving line integrals, how to calculate them. So first, I just want to go over some basic properties of them I've written here. Um, so if you have the integral of p u of z plus q v of z on um, on this 
curve gamma, and p and q are just uh, some complex numbers, then you can factor out the p, you can factor out the q, and you can separate this integral with u and v. So that's good to know. This is like with real numbers. Um, and remember in the previous video we talked about negative curves where you can take negative gamma which is traversed in the reverse direction. Then if you want an integral on negative gamma, then you just take the negative integral with gamma. Okay. And then the last one, um, we'll use this first to solidify a concept for us. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about the, in, the addition of two curves. So if we have gamma 1 plus gamma 2, then what is that? Well, if we have gamma 1, let's say, this is gamma 1 going in this direction from A to B, and then we have gamma 2 starting at the end point here and going to C, um, then gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is the curve that starts at A, ends at C, and follows this uh, path. And the important thing to note is that when you add two curves, um, the thing that has to be true is that the beginning point of the second curve has to be the same as the end point of the first curve, or else you can't add them. So assuming you can add them, uh, integral of the sum of two curves, uh, v, v of z dz, equals the integral with one curve, v of z dz, plus the integral uh, with the other curve, v of z dz. So you, kinda, you can split them up. You're allowed to do that. So now that we have these properties in mind, um, we are going to spend the rest of the time uh, proving an important inequality that has to do with line integrals. So this uh, will be a little bit involved, so let's just stick with it. Okay, so first, this is what we're going to be trying to prove. And these bars, again, are modulus. So although this may seem like a very nasty thing, this integral from a to b, f of t, dt, it is, in the end, just a complex number, because when you add a bunch of stuff up, you're just getting a complex number. So for simplicity, let's rename it k. And k is the complex number, and that's just the inside. So what we're doing is the modulus of k, and we're trying to prove that that is less than or equal to when you take the integral from a to b and instead you take the modulus of f of t at each t that you're putting in. Okay, so we're going to try to prove it and then I'll show you why it's uh, useful for us at all. So we rename this k and then since it's a complex number it lies somewhere on the complex plane. Okay, so let's just say it lies here. And then again it has a modulus so this is called modulus of k, the distance to the origin. And as we've shown in previous videos, maybe two or three videos before this, uh, we can write this again as k cosine theta plus i uh, modulus k sine theta. And that equals k, because we can break this into horizontal vertical components. And theta will be the angle with respect to the positive real axis again. Okay, so we can write this as this, and again we can factor out the k, and get cosine theta plus i sine theta. And this we can write again as e to the i theta from the exponential video equals k. Okay, and then now we want to try to get k alone, uh, modulus k alone. So this equals e to the minus i theta times k. Okay, so I just divided by e to the i theta on both sides to get the modulus k alone. So now the first thing we're going to assume, we're going to assume that integral of from a to b f of t dt or i guess i renamed a k does not equal zero and it can equal zero but see what happens if it equals zero if this is equal to zero then is zero less than or equal to this well it's going to be because when you take the modulus of f of t for every t that you're putting in um, modulus is always positive numbers so you're just basically uh, it could be zero also but you're basically just taking uh, from A to B, you're just adding a bunch of positive numbers or zero. So that's obviously going to be greater than or equal to something that's zero. So it's true for the zero case. So let's try to prove it for all the other cases. So we're going to show, we're going to assume here that k does not equal zero. This integral is not zero. Okay, so we assume that uh, modulus k is greater than zero because k is not equal to zero. Um, and then what we do is that's going to be e to the negative i theta times k, as we just uh, showed right here. And then what we want to do uh, from there is expand this uh, back to its definition. And then this is because k is just equal to this. Now this e to the negative i theta, theta is fixed. Theta is just that angle. It's not a variable. So I can just put it right back into this integral if I want. 
so a to b, e to the minus i, theta, f of t, dt. And now I want to do a little bit of renaming. I'm going to rename this right here. Uh, we're going to call it g of t, a new function. So this is going to be integral from a to b, g of t, dt. Okay, so the next thing that we want to do is show that, or rather notice that this integral, integral of a to b, uh, of g of t from a to b is positive. And the reason for that is, trace this all the way back, this is all greater than zero. So this is greater than zero, so it's a positive number. And since it's a positive number, let's take its real part and look at that a little bit. So the real part of g of the integral from a to b of g of t, we can take the real inside here. And for a uh, reason of why you can do this, check out uh, this video, which will explain a few lemmas in this proof overall. So um, if we take this, uh, if you look at that video, you can pause this video, look at that video, come back. So this is true. And uh, let's move on to the next paper. And now, uh, okay, let's look back at this paper for just a second. Um, we're looking at the real part of integral of g of t from a to b. And since this is just a positive number and uh, modulus k is just a positive number and they're equal furthermore, they have equal real parts. And furthermore, since they're just positive numbers, the real part of this is equal to this and is equal to the real part of this. So we uh, will write that right here. We'll write that real part of integral g of t from a to b equals modulus of k. And then as we just did, that equals integral a to b real part of g of t dt. And now something to note, I'll just draw a quick graph. If you have any complex number, the real part is always less than the modulus because the modulus is the hypotenuse. So this is less than or equal to integral a to b modulus g of t dt. And now from here, we're going to use the definition we shown in the previous video. Let's see, where did I define it? Uh, here, where g of t equals e to the negative i theta f of t. So that means that this equals a to b. Uh, okay, so this equals this because since g of t equals the inside of this modulus, the modulus of g of t is equal to the modulus of e to the negative i theta f of t. And something else that you'll see in the video, which I'll link again right here, um, is this is the lemma video. You'll see that if you have two complex numbers, let's say z and w, and you're taking the modulus of their product, then that's the same thing as the product of their moduli. So using that rule, we see that this right here equals integral a to b modulus e to the negative i theta uh, modulus f of t dt. And modulus e to the negative i theta, if you expand it in cosine and sines, is just equal to 1. So now we're here, we're just dealing with e to the, uh, we're dealing with modulus f of t dt from a to b. So what have we showed here? We have showed uh, that, uh, okay, let's just go back here. So we said that real part of this quantity, which is equal to modulus of k, equals this, which is less than all of this. So that means modulus of k, and k we'll write out again, modulus of a to b f of t dt, which is k. So modulus of k is less than or equal to, which was here, um, what we just found here, integral a to b modulus f of t dt. And let's highlight this, put it in brown. And now let's look at what we were trying to prove and compare it with that. So we, here we're trying to prove uh, integral a to b f of t dt is less than or equal to integral a to b modulus f of t dt, which is exactly what this statement is right here. So we have proved uh, what we have set out to prove, but now let us look at why this is useful for our purposes, why it's useful for uh, line integrals and stuff like that. So let's keep this result handy and let's apply it to line integrals. So what is the line integral? The line integral uh, was integral, we said v of z dz. And now let's take the modulus of this and this is equal to, as we said, uh, modulus a to b v of gamma t gamma prime t dt, and I'll take the modulus of all of that. 
And now, by the theorem we just did, this is less than or equal to integral a to b modulus v of gamma of t times modulus gamma prime of t uh, dt. And now this is very looking very messy, so let's just go over, make sure everything I do is valid, so you believe it. Um, so this is just the definition of the line integral, and everything's in modulus. And now, using the theorem we just found, um, this theorem right here. So this theorem says that whenever you have an integral a to b of some function of t, and what we have here is some function of t, although it's very large and split into two parts, this is still a function of t. So all of this is a function of t, just like f of t is. That is less than or equal to integral from a to b of the modulus of that function of t. And that's what I've done here. I've taken the modulus of that function of t, and I've split it into two products, just like we are allowed to do because of the lemma video uh, that you hopefully watched. Okay, so to finish up um, from the previous paper, we had, uh, we had integral a to b modulus v gamma t uh, modulus gamma prime of t dt. Okay, so let's finish up. So we have this integral. And now let's look at one part of this integral as a separate integral. Gamma prime of t dt. We're just going to look at this integral really fast. And if gamma is x of t plus i y of t, then we said gamma prime of t equals x prime t plus i y prime t. Okay, so now if we take integral a to b, and what is the modulus of this? Well, it's going to be um, it's going to be square root of x prime t squared plus y prime t squared dt, and this is by uh, Pythagorean theorem because the modulus of something is just a hypotenuse of the real uh, and imaginary parts, which are the legs. So now this is important because if you remember from calculus, this is the formula uh, for the length of a curve. So this equals the length of gamma, actually. So if you need a refresher, go back and look at your calculus notes. But um, the this this is the formula for when you parametrize a curve, even in the real variables, this is going to be the length of the curve. So this integral right here, um, really this one, is equal to the length of gamma. And this is very helpful for us because this helps us make a very important estimate. So now let me reproduce this integral at the bottom and now let's analyze it. So a to b, v gamma t, gamma prime t dt. Okay, so now to finish up, let's look at this. So when you do this integral, let's just go through it and see what happens. So let's say t is going from a to b. So let's say you start at a. For t, and then you put that in into each of these components, and let's just make a list. So you get v of uh, let's say gamma one times this is going to be gamma prime of a, but we'll just call it l one because it's going to be a component of the length. Now you put in the next t. What do you get? You get v of gamma two times l two, and you just keep going all the way to b until you get v of gamma n times length n. Now each of these v's um, is going to be, or really they should each be modulus of v because we're adding up moduli of v, um, but they're each going to be different. But the point is there's going to be a maximum one of them, which means that they're all, they're all going to be different, but there's going to be a biggest one. And let's call that biggest one m for max. So now we know that this is going to be less than or equal to m times l1 plus m times l2 plus dot 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 plus m times ln. And let's analyze that for a second. I just replace each of these moduli v gamma 1, v gamma 2, v gamma n with m because I want to make I want to make something that's greater. So I just replace each of them by the maximum value. So even if they were each the maximum value, this would still be greater than or equal to. It would be equal to. So now I can factor out the m. And what I'm left with is L1 plus L2 plus blah, 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 plus Ln. And what we saw from this integral is that, that all those Ls add up to the length of gamma. And that's because all those Ls are really just, comp it's really just this integral right here. Because they're just these components. So that's going to be length of gamma. Okay, so we M times length of gamma. So after all this mess, what we have found is that, and I'll write it here in a completely different color, is that 
integral uh, of v of z dz, the line integral, its modulus is less than or equal to the maximum value of modulus v of z on gamma, remember this has to be the maximum value on the curve, times length of gamma. So this right now may not seem very astounding, um, but it's a very important estimate that we'll be using later on for proofs, and it's going to be very, very, very helpful, I promise. So um, go through that proof once or twice if it didn't make sense, um, and just try to click the pieces into place, and it should make sense. So until next time.